Great, well, good morning. And Jason, thank you so much for helping us really frame the day with what the, the challenges are, what the incredible opportunities are out there. What I want to do in the time I have with you is get you to think about you know, this wonderful range of expertise we have sitting in this room and how we can be a curve what really needs to happen in bringing the range of expertise together in learning and in technology to really improve the learning for all learners everywhere. And the theme that I'm going to work with right, is that we're making rapid advances in understanding how it is that people learn. And in our technology-enabled world, we're making great advances. But these two trajectories aren't informing each other as much as they can. And if we can find better ways to do that, and keep our eye on really improving the quality of the learning and the persistence and the success of learners everywhere, then we're really going to hit a home run together. So the boundaries are blurring, as Jason laid out in his talk, right? Face-to-face -face and technology-enhanced learning are no longer either ors. What used to be the world of formal and informal learning is melding together. We're seeing that in terms of you know, academic civic engagement in university campuses and citizen science, all starting to come back into classrooms. We're seeing what was once, you know, you went to someone's lab and did research. Now we're seeing actual research coming into the learning environments of students every day. And as Jason so beautifully laid out, right, we are dealing with a world where we've got to make sense of what to do with credentials, um, badges, certificates. So we've got this incredible opportunity, but the reality is right now we're living in a very siloed world. Yes, this is my, my Midwestern roots here. <laughs> and you know, I, I didn't catch everything up here, but we, we've historically siloed the disciplines, of course. Um, but we've got this huge ecosystem that's coming up where we have learning engineers, learning scientists. Um, we have our academic technologists, information technologists, um, in, uh, designers, of course, all sorts of things. And we're going at it in our own little private universes, and we're not working together. And if our learner is really going to be successful, we've got to find better ways to build bridges. So how do we do that? One suggestion is we really need to think about focus, not just working together, but focus. And I'm going to offer an example um, as you know, someone working at the National Science Foundation. The federal government in the area of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics decided it was really important that we have some coherence of what we're trying to do across our 14 federal agencies to drive improvement, right? We all want to accelerate the rate of improvement. It's not happening quickly enough to meet the need that's <laughs> out there. And so there is now a federal strategic plan to improve STEM learning, and it cuts across all different um, groups of learners, from informal learning to young learners through graduate, education, focusing on things like increasing the number of high quality teachers, improving the success of undergraduates in completing college, in this case in STEM majors. I, I'm leading the undergrad effort across the federal agencies. And then we focus on just four key things. And they're huge, right? I mean, I, I'm claiming we're doing some focus. I think you have to realize even these are huge. But how is it that we actually get good evidence-based practices into the learning environment, whether it's online, whether it's face-to-face, -face, whether it's hybrid. And what do we do to improve the experience of students in two-year colleges and their ability to move into four-year learning environments? And that doesn't have to be bricks and mortar, right? How do we get better integration with industry to create authentic experiences? So all these computer scientists that we're um, meeting actually are well prepared for the world of work. And how do we begin to deal with the real challenge that mathematics is presenting to students, not just in STEM fields, but in all fields? How do we switch math from being a gatekeeper to a gateway um, to very positive um, learning experiences? So, we really need to do a better job with partnerships, with networks, and with networks of networks. And 
I tried to put some examples, and whenever you start to make a list, of course it's not going to be a complete list, but three groups that I think we can think about that are relevant to what we're doing here yesterday and today. Right? We've got instructional technologists, instructional designers, learning engineers, computer scientists. How do we create better networks of those folks working together and then bring that network together with all the folks working in science of learning? So if you're not in education, you may think, ah, oh, there's this wonderful world of folks out there working on learning sciences and it's all beautiful and all we have to do is go over and figure out what we're doing and we're going to have awesome online courses. Well, we have a challenge too because within these areas, um, they've grown up separately. They're very siloed. Folks that work in learning science are distinct from cognitive psychologists, from education psychologists, from cognitive science, from discipline-based education research and the scholarship of teaching and learning, which actually developed at the Carnegie Foundation where we were on the Hill last night. And for those of you that were looking around the room um, last night when Tony Brake spoke, right, this notion of bringing improvement science in a networked way into education actually uh, arose there. And the, the plea is to bring practitioners and researchers, uh, improvement groups, together from the get-go to figure out what the most pressing problems are and to work on them together, not to wait five or ten years down the road for the research to scale to very, very large scale um, work and then only later figure out how to translate it into practice. So I want to, uh, the, the learning technology piece that I think you probably have a good sense of, I wanted to just give you some examples of where there could be some real benefits with integrating even the learning sciences and then bringing that into the world of online, of mobile, of digital. So cognitive psychology is done under very precise conditions in labs, and a lot of us are interested in moving this out into the wild. So as we begin to think about what it takes to develop expertise and the productive practice and the right number of steps, we've got some really interesting opportunities in our online environments thinking about how important retrieval practice is, right? You can read something over and over and over again, and you're not going to retain it any better. But if you have frequent quizzing where you have to actually pull that information out, it's going to stick with you, and there's a really sound body of evidence there. There are a number of, of books and analysis articles. I put up this particular one as a reference up here, if you're interested, from Dunlosky, because they looked and said, well, we know a lot from educational psychology and cognitive psychology. How many of these studies have been done in more than one environment with different kinds of learners? How confident can we be that this would be a good thing to try and scale? Um, spacing out practice, right? Human nature, we all cram before the deadline. It doesn't really work well for enduring learning. Elaboration, how do we deal with cognitive load that our brains get full, right? So making your own meaning, telling your own narrative um, also helps to make things stick in your mind. And then there's things we do that probably aren't such a great idea. You know, we still see a lot of folks catering to learning styles, kinesthetic learners, visual learners, auditory learners, and at very best, the, the research is equivocal on the value there, so probably not worth spending huge amounts of time. So not just what should you weave in, but what might you let go of? We also really need to pay more attention to work emerging in social psychology and related fields. This came up yesterday, right? Bringing all the basic research we have on the non-cognitive domain into an applied way. We're not quite there yet, right? This, that within California, there's a lot of conversation about testing in the non-cognitive domain. We don't have the right measurements or tools to put in that applied setting. These are tools that were developed in a research setting. So how can we figure out how we actually genuinely assess these skills from collaboration to communication to persistence to a you know, productive mindset about learning resilience? Um, even your identity as a scientist or as an artist or as a humanist, um, how do we build social capital and see our value in that? 
And one of the things in our rush to take what we know from educational science as learning science and apply it is sometimes we don't bring in our disciplinary partners with whatever that discipline is. So again, coming from the National Science Foundation, I'm going to focus on the science areas, but bringing together cutting edge science and cutting edge research has been something the NSF has been focusing on since we were chartered in the 50s. And we're seeing again in the higher ed level what we saw in the 60s and 70s in K-12, where really deep disciplinary science knowledge is being used to support the education research. And a field called discipline-based education research has emerged within the universities coming out of the, um, physics departments, coming out of biology departments, chemistry departments, really marrying the two efforts together. And I wanted to share one example of that with you. This is some work that Sian Bailik and her colleagues had done at the University of Chicago and surrounding um, schools. And I'm doing it for two things. One reason is it shows how we can link together learning science and the disciplines. But it also, I think, gives us an opportunity to think about what things can we do best online that we've never done before what things right now really work best in a physical environment where we might want to take what limited dollars we have and really push on those because we value those skills? How do we begin to make those decisions in an informed way? So what Sian and her colleagues did, they worked um, in a physics, introductory physics classroom and laboratory setting. And there's a concept called angular momentum. And I'm just going to briefly describe the experiment to you. And you're going to end up being the observer that was in this study, so you're not going to get the full benefit of this, but um, bear with me. Um, in the picture, you can see a bicycle wheel and another small wheel and then a spoke that goes through it, right? So you can imagine holding on to a spinning bicycle wheel. So in this classroom, some of the students were actually holding on to the spinning bicycle wheel, and it was spinning pretty quickly, and others were watching. And then the student that was holding it tipped the wheel. There's a huge amount of physical force, a torque that gets exerted by this that you can actually feel in your body. So now we're talking about something that started with philosophers we referred to it as embodied cognition. Um, so you're, you're experiencing this. OK, so some students watched. Some of you just got to listen and not really even watch. And then everybody solved a bunch of physics problems, including those associated with this concept of angular momentum, this torque that's coming from spinning the wheels. The students that actually held the wheel did better on the angular momentum problems, but not the other physics problems. Everybody else did the same. So it wasn't just that you, know, you happened to hand the wheel to the smart students in the class. Then they got the students, and I don't know how they got, sorry, I was too busy making my, my spoke. I apologize. Um, I, I was into, into the moment. Um, they then convinced these students to go into fMRIs and it solve these problems. So if you've been in an MRI, right, it's a pretty small space. If you're claustrophobic, it's kind of unpleasant. Anyhow, these students are very brave and adventurous, and they're in there, and they're using just their fingers to answer the problems, right? So there's no large muscle moments. And we found out that different parts of the brain lit up in the students that had had the prior physical experience. So the learning that goes on is different when there's physical interaction than when there's observational interaction. Now, maybe in the world of virtual reality, we can create some of these experiences, like the blue shark that the Navy does where you're flying over an aircraft carrier, you're landing a plane on the aircraft carrier, you're driving the aircraft carrier. We don't know, but I think they're important things to think about. So what we want to do is we want to scale effective approaches in all environments and make sure it's the right environment. And we have a lot of evidence that we can build on to do that. We know from the discipline-based education research, if we're talking just undergrads, that we know about challenges with students' conceptual understandings and how to move that. We know a fair bit about how to help with problem solving, about ways to effectively use representations and effective instructional strategies. 
there's a report that recently came out of the National Academies called Reaching Students, which is a practitioner volume based on this discipline-based education research report that was released a few years ago. There's also a MOOC on evidence-based learning that we funded through the NSF and all sorts of tools that are out there to help practitioners figure out how to scale effectively and to build on the deep knowledge base from the social sciences. But there's a lot we need to accelerate about learning. We don't know, especially at the undergrad level and beyond, as much about differences and similarities amongst different groups of learners. We haven't really disaggregated that work. And the large scale um, work that's going on digitally may give us an inroad, longitudinal studies. We actually need to know more about learning fundamentally. And we don't know as much about learning across different disciplines, which in a world where convergence right, among different fields is driving work, we've got to figure out how to help our learners get better. And we have to get better at measuring all these interpersonal and intrapersonal competencies. And we have to figure out how we scale effective practice. And MOOCs seem to have done that. There's a really an interesting increase in commitment and interest to effective practice in universities, uh, a happy and perhaps unintended consequence. So how is it that we take this data-driven research that's emerging from MOOCs and use that to not only improve learning, but to actually drive what we know about education so we can get better at education? And this goes back to my initial diagram. How do we get better at both? And we know from like, biology with the world of genomics that this model works really well and should work in education. So as you build all these really cool mobile apps, how can you also build some back doors into it so that we're learning while honoring privacy concerns? So a nice example of how this all comes together, given that we heard from Tony Burke last night, is the work that he and Ari Treisman and other colleagues have been doing to improve developmental mathematics. And using a model where you have researchers and practitioners defining a problem, working together from the get-go in a networked manner and scaling it, they've been able to triple the success rates of their learners in half the amount of time. Developmental math, right, I mentioned early on, is a huge barrier to success. And they've rethought and continuously improved how developmental math is taught. So oops, I went too far. OK. Um, so what I, I want to leave you with is both a challenge and an opportunity. I think we're all so excited in this room about being able to learn anytime, anywhere. And it's truly fantastic. But the real challenge, I think, of disaggregated education is exactly that, that it's becoming disaggregated. I live a mile on the ground the road with a one-house schoolhouse at the end that was still used when you know I would have been a small child had I lived there. And you had one teacher that helped you connect all the knowledge. Now we have everything out there where you literally can learn anything you want. But prior learning is key. Our brains are wired to be really motivated and challenged to learn when the knowledge gap is reachable. But when it's a chasm, we just turn off our brains. We know that transferring learning from one setting to another is very hard. And we know from work with young children that building learning progressions is a way to move people towards expertise. The um, diagram up here comes from the recent Harvard X MITx report where we can begin to see pathways that students are taking. And it may be that from this online environment, we can get a better sense of the pathways, but somehow we have to help students understand how to construct their own learning progressions. And if we want to build lifelong learners, this is an incredibly valuable skill. So the disruption is probably driving us to do something we needed to do anyhow. But we've got to think about how we structure that learning and not just hope for the best. So the challenges ahead are we need to collectively create both robust implementation and research infrastructures that are linked together so we're continually getting better. Um, in a focused and intentional way. And we really need to think hard about how we're going to help our learners deal with this disaggregated system and make sense of their learning. So thank you very much.